Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> Christmas. What it means to the world is a totally different thing from what it means to you and I as believers in Christ. It's not just about our giving of gifts to each other, though that's a part of it. It has a much more deeper and spiritual and powerful message. And that's what we've been speaking about. Christmas, the great adventure. Any more of you having adventures in Christ? Yeah. Every day is an adventure in Christ. Advent is defined as the four weeks of spiritual preparation. Just kind of to remind all of us, and some of us are new this morning, that Advent is that four weeks of spiritual preparation just before Christmas. That's why we light the Advent candles to remind us each week of a, of a new truth. It is a time of spiritual preparation where we look within and say, where am I at? What am I doing? How am I measuring my life? What's a success? What isn't a success within my life? And am I doing what God intended me to do, a spiritual preparation? All of that in terms of what God has done for us through the life of Jesus. The Advent is the time when we celebrate not just the first coming of Christ. Again, I always look over. They took the baby Jesus with them. I guess that's probably a good reminder that he's no longer in the crash, in the cradle. Where is he now? Back at the throne of God. God had an adventure, which is the same, and I guess I haven't said that to this crowd, just so we're clear, the word advent comes from the same root word as the word adventure. Or adventure. God had an adventure. He left the throne of heaven. Wow. For 33 years. And came and walked among men. Took upon himself the form of a servant. Wow. And what was his main purpose? To say what? And as I come with love to tell you that I love you, I'm also here to say, I know things aren't right. Any of you get that sense every now and then that everything isn't exactly the way you wanted it or planned it? Okay. That's what he's come to say. I'm going to make it right through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to remind us of his first historic Coming or Advent, which is what it means, as well as the prophesied second Advent. And then he says to us, yes, I took an adventure. I left the throne of heaven, came to earth, lived for 33 years, was crucified as the Lamb of God for your sins, resurrected, went back and sat by the throne of God. That was the adventure. And now he says to you and I, would you join my adventure? God's not the only one who's to have an adventure. You and I are to have an adventure. Never forget that the Christian life is a daring, romantic adventure with a person who loves you more than anybody else has ever loved you or could love you. And that person is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, Advent has an amazing call attached to it. That's why Christ came. He came to call us. Call us what? Call us into a relationship. It's always a great joy to see young couples like uh, Josh and Shirley uh, again because I've watched the call within their lives as they discover each other. A call that maybe wasn't there with other young people and a call that is there and you feel that call and then you're drawn to each other. That's the kind of call, advent, adventure, that God has with you and I. He's calling us into a loving relationship. Ooh. A loving relationship. He's calling to us. Gordon, Shirley, Talina. 
Barb, Marsha, come, come on. Let's you and I have a relationship. Wow. With the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Not a bad deal, Jason, huh? Wow. He came to earth to call us. But he also came to earth to save us. From what? From ourselves. <laughs> How many of you feel like at times you need to be saved from yourself? Yeah. To be saved from sin that is born within us that we can be delivered from. To save us from all that isn't beautiful and pure and holy. To save us from a humdrum life. From a life that we're not happy with. To a life that is transformed by His glory and His grace. He came to save us. But He also came to transform. To take all that is old and tired and bring it into that which is new and exciting. A romantic, daring journey and adventure. And lastly, He came to equip us. Equip us for what? Some of you are college students. College is out. Any more classes? Oh, and what do you say to that? Woo, hallelujah, amen, praise God. Classes are out. School is out. He came to equip us. Equipping comes through schools, but it also comes through the presence of God speaking to us. Speaking to us and saying, there's something I want you to do. God has a job description for you. And you know what? It has to do with eternity, not just time. Eternity. He is equipping us to rule and to reign at His side for all of eternity. Think of the universe. Billions upon billions of stars in every galaxy. Millions of galaxies. Some of them possibly uh, inhabited. We wouldn't be foolish enough to think we're the only place that God put people. And yet he says very clearly to us, I am equipping you to rule and to reign over all of the universe. Wow. We ought to stand a little taller with that. How many of you at times have felt there's more potential in me than I ever reached? Yeah. There's more in me. I'm capable of bigger and better things. Wait till you see what he's got for you for eternity. Awesome. Today, maybe like you, I struggle with ruling over me. <laughs> Any of you feel that at times? But He is equipping us to rule over the universe by His side for eternity. That's His purpose. Romans 8.28. We all like to claim the first part of Romans 8.28. What's Romans 8.28? Okay. All things, with a few exceptions, right? No. All things work together for good to what? Those who are the called. He doesn't say if you're living your own life, doing what you want to do, looking to please you, that all things will work out for you. Mm -mm -mm. He's saying if you turn your life over to Christ, your Creator and your Lord, that He will cause all things to work out for you, for your good. Wow. And who does that apply to? The called, according to His purposes, Romans 8.28 says. The called. Greek word there is ekklesia. Ekklesia. Ek means in the Greek, out. Out. Klesia means called. We are literally a called out group. The church, 
needs to be different than the world. It needs to be more loving, more kind, more powerful, more able to view what's going on in our world and respond and react in ways that are good and healthy, able to bring the healing of Christ, able to bring the prophetic view of Christ to the world. That's what we're called to do. Now, here, before eternity. Oh, sometimes I fail at that. Far more than I'd like to. That's why he is equipping us. He's teaching us. We're in school right now. We're in school. We're learning. But there will come a day where he will finish that. But make no mistake about it, the church is the called out group. I find it tragic and sad but interesting to see that out of all of God's created people, the church is a small minority. Many people choose not to surrender their lives to Christ. He does not promise that he will bring all things to your good if you don't surrender to him. He's given us life. He's given us breath. And in that life and breath, he says, as you surrender that to me, I'll bring joy. I'll bring healing. I'll bring what you need in the midst of your life according to his purposes. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, you are a chosen people or gathering. Again, he speaks to all of those who have received Christ. You are a chosen people. Hmm. And then he goes on to say beyond that, you are a royal priesthood. Oh. Oh. Probably this Christmas it would be a good time for the church to repent that the world doesn't get a better look at us as being in the image of Christ. I am delighted. If, if I say the word, the phrase, duck dynasty, does that mean anything to you? Oh, you've been following that controversy, have you? Wow. May we learn to be those who take a stand. May we learn to be those who stand up and say, you know what? I love everybody. That's not the issue. The issue isn't are you gay or straight or this or that. The issue is have you surrendered your life to Jesus? And God has some standards. And he's laid them down for all of us. First of all, I'm reminded by that event that happened this week. And I think most of you are aware of that that none of us are without sin. And then Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Phil Robertson was not casting stones. He was making a statement of God's standards and saying we all need to live according to those standards. How many of you felt the earth shake a little bit this week when that happened. When A&E said, Phil Robertson, you're out of here. You will not appear on this show. And I saw TV network after TV network stand up and say, wow, this is something. And then I heard Phil come back and say, you know what, let me be clear here. There is not one ounce of a hate in my heart. I love every one of God's creatures. But I also have to please God and not man. And when God says this is the way things are, then I need to surrender to Him. And that's all He was saying. There are some standards. You know what? The church isn't always very good at meeting those standards either. I'm talking about the general standards of God. The church isn't always great about meeting those standards. We were talking earlier during communion time about the fact that all of us are sinners. Starting with a preacher. Any amens on that? 
starting with you and I, all of us have failed to meet the standards of God. I understood clearly what Phil Robertson was saying. He wasn't saying I'm standing in judgment. He was saying every person in the church or out of the church will one day come to be measured by the standards of God. It was a wonderful reminder, I think, that there are other standards than what the world sets. And whether or not you like those standards or whether or not you accept those standards, they exist. And they come from God. And His Word, His plans, His purposes, that's the final court of appeal. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. And as such, by CJ. Is my grandson cute or what? <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No, I'm not. <laughs> I repent. <laughs> All right. And I see those pictures of Xander online. He is so cute. And I see our children. God has blessed us with beautiful, inquiring minds and, and, and exciting children. And, and, uh, and I learned so much about me by looking at and responding to my children. Some of it is not all good. And I don't mean because of them. I mean because of the way we react and we respond. Anyway, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And what are we here for? To reflect the standards of God, the praises of God. That's what we're here for. Of him, reflect the phrases of him, praises of him who called you out of darkness. The world lives in darkness and doesn't even know it. And some who know it don't care. God says, I have called you out of darkness, bless you, and into my marvelous light. Let me ask you, would you rather wander around in the dark? I mean, literally. Or would you rather there be sunshine? How many of us get discouraged and maybe depressed with clouds and clouds and clouds and clouds and clouds and clouds? How many of you would rather have sunshine, bright, warm sunshine? Rest assured, according to the Weather Channel, there is supposed to be a little bit of sunshine from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock this afternoon, believe it or not. And then for the next seven days, mm, there's not supposed to be any sunshine. I love sunshine. It does something in my heart. Why? And by the way, the darkness does something. It's called sad. Seasonal affect disorder. Uh, the clouds and darkness all the time and the change of times. If you're not careful, that darkness overcomes you. And you can even become depressed over that. Let me tell you, that's not the plan of God. God says, walk in the light. The light of Jesus. He created the light. He promises us that the light can fill our hearts. So he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. The Apostle John is sitting imprisoned in the Isle of Patmos. He will be brutally murdered before his life is over shortly after he has written this. For what? For his faith. I have the picture here of a wonderful family that is torn apart by the fact that dad is sitting in an Iranian prison who's a preacher and an American citizen sitting in an Iranian prison for one crime and one crime only. I will not repent or recant my faith in Jesus Christ. It's the only reason he's there. You say, well, how do you know that? Because they've told him, if you will recant Christ, we'll set you free. He's been there over a year for just saying, I love Jesus, I've accepted Christ, and I'm going to live in him. I pray regularly for him, for his family, for his two beautiful children that God will release him and restore them. But John was on the Isle of Patmos, imprisoned for his faith, about to die. And he writes this. Beloved, that's y'all. 
That's southern for you. Y'all. Beloved, y'all, we are here and now. Those who've received Christ and believe in Him. We are here and now the kids of God. The children of God. How? Well, first by creation. Every one of us have been created by God. Scripture says we were created in the mind of God before the foundations of the world were laid. We were created in His mind. But we're also His children, not just by creation, but those who have received Christ. We are His children by salvation. We've received Him as Savior and Lord, knowing that much is missing within us and we need His deliverance within our lives. Beloved, we are now the children of God. But it has not yet been fully revealed, Paul says, what we will be in eternity. Hasn't been fully revealed, but listen to this, what he does say about it. Huh. But we know that when He comes. What does the word Advent mean? Coming. We celebrated this morning the first coming of Christ in Bethlehem as a child. He came as the Lamb of God, slain on the altar of God before the foundations of the world. God the Father said, Son, are you willing to go? I'm going to send you to die for the sins of mankind so that they can spend eternity with us, have a relationship with us. Are you willing to go? Yes. And he came. And that's Christmas. And we celebrate the first Advent. But there's a second Advent. Talks about it here in this verse. He's coming again. But we know that when He comes again, at the second Advent, which, by the way, according to the prophecies of Scripture, can be any day, we know that when He comes again, we shall be like Him. Like who? Christ. What is Christ like? Shoot it out. What is Christ like? Perf Somebody said perfect. Wow, I've striven so hard to be perfect and I've come so short. He's wonderful. What is He? He's light. He's what? Our Father. Okay. Everything you want to be and wish you could be, He is. Everything you want to be. He is. And this verse says, when you step into eternity for those who believe in Christ, you will be just like Him. This body has a little bit of arthritis in it, has an enlarged heart, has, has a uh, slower mind than it used to. <laughs> this body mm, is going to be replaced with an immortal, perfect body just like Christ's. Say, how do you know that? Because I just read it in the Word of God. I just read it. But we know. We don't guess. We don't hope. We know. The, the Greek word there is epignosis. It means a full intimate knowledge of the truth that when we see Him, we shall be like Him. Just like Him. Why? For we shall see Him as He really is. I read that, and I was thinking this morning of the passage that says, no man hath seen God at any time. Do you know that at this point in history, no man has ever seen all of God in all of his fullness at any time in all of man's history? Moses probably came the closest on uh, Mount Pisgah where he received the Ten Commandments, and it says that when he came down, the, uh, uh, the glory of God was all over his face. But he only saw God in a burning bush. He didn't see all of God because no man hath seen God at any time. This says, when Christ comes in his second coming, we shall be like him for we shall see him in all of his fullness. And we're going to be in eternity just like him. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I get so excited about that. Everything I'm not and wish I was, for all of eternity I will be. Why? Because I worked hard and tried to, and, and did a self-reformation program and gave this up for Lent and, and changed that and worked hard at doing this. No. Because as the next verse says, in one ten thousandth of a second, God will do what I haven't been able to do in 65 years. Make me perfect. <laughs> so what do you mean one ten thousandth of a second? That's the twinkling of an eye. Science has measured it. It's how long it takes moisture in the glint of your eye to just reflect back. One ten thousandth of a second. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall be raised or made incorruptible. This world is so corrupt. From Albany to Washington to our own hearts unbelievably corrupted. And God says, I'm going to change all that and I'm going to make you incorruptible as a blessing and a gift to you. Whew, boy, could I use that. Today would be a good day, Lord. <laughs> he says, we shall be made incorruptible and shall be changed and then it says, and this mortal shall put on immortality. How? Through receiving Christ, through the cross. The only way is through the cross. It's not through human effort. Some days, and I don't even compare in any way, shape, or form with the Apostle Paul, but Paul talks about all the things he went through, the beatings, and, and uh, the, he was shipwrecked and bitten by a snake and all kinds of things serving Christ that... that you would think could make him as a prime example of who could grow to be good and perfect. Paul says in Romans, I do the things I don't want to do. And I can't seem to do the things I know I ought to do. Any of you struggle with that besides me? Oh, okay. All right. But Paul said we are going to be changed from a corruptible mortal to being incorruptible for all of eternity. Revelation 22, again, Paul on the Isle of Patmos. And he sees a vision. And the vision he's looking at is the throne of God. And he looks at the throne and he notices that the Lamb of God is sitting on the throne. The Lamb of God. Who's the Lamb of God? Jesus Christ. Why is he called the Lamb of God? Because he was sacrificed. He was the pure Lamb of God sacrificed for my sins. And the th on the throne in the Lamb was the Lamb of God, and it shall be in the holy city. That's a new Jerusalem. It's not the old Jerusalem, but a new one that's going to be created. And he says, the servants of God shall serve him. Are you a servant of God? We're the servant. The church is the servants of God. We exist to serve Him. We exist to serve Him. And what does it say about us in eternity around the throne? And they shall what? Reign. Not the kind of we've had for the last six days. Not that kind of reign. We shall rule and reign with Christ, with Him, for a short time. Oh, thank you, Cliff. Cliff says, no, forever and ever. And then we put an amen. Forever and ever. Amen and amen. How do, does all that happen within us? By the simple faith of saying, I need the Lord Jesus. My life is not perfect. I am not what I want to be. I'm not what I ought to be. And the only way I'm ever going to get there is to receive Christ and let him make me to be what I ought to be. And he'll do it so lovingly and so graciously and, and so mercifully. The scripture says Jesus did not come to condemn us. He does convict me of sin within my life. He says, Gordon, come on, you know better than that. 
You're not supposed to say that, think that, do that. You know that. That's conviction. That's the sweet conviction of the Holy Spirit. I have never once heard condemnation from God. In the 65 years I've served him, I've never heard God condemn me. I've condemned myself. Any of you want to join me on that one? <laughs> Self-condemnation is a big deal. But we've got to believe what Christ said. He convicts us of sin, gives us the power to overcome it by simply giving him control of our lives. And then he prepares us to rule and to reign with him for all of eternity.